Welcome to the Investigation Game Podcast, brought to you by Workman Forensics. Welcome to the Investigation Game Podcast. I'm Leah Wheatholter, CEO of Workman Forensics in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Joining me today is Nicole Landau. Nicole is a business owner, certified fraud examiner, and virtual CFO who hosts her own construction podcast with the theme of construction risk management. She obtained her CFE in 2011 and has been investigating fraud ever since. She's performed investigations in banking, oil and gas, restaurants, and construction industries. She's worked with the Office of the Comptroller of Currency and the Federal Bureau of Investigation on large cases of internal theft. As owner of Landau Consulting Solutions, Nicole oversees outsourced accounting and CFO services for construction companies. She also performs fraud investigations and fraud prevention and detection trainings. Nicole inspires business owners to step up, take action, and implement fraud prevention measures. Thank you for joining me today, Nicole. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So when I think of the content that you share that I see on LinkedIn, I immediately think about construction fraud, which will be the focus of our episode today. But before we get into that, uh, related to your bio, what did the case involving the OCC and FBI Intel and, you know... You can tell us as much or as little as you would like on this, because I know we all love a good fraud story. Absolutely. So I'll tell a little bit of a background because this is how I got into working fraud investigations. Um, And a step before that, I was still in public accounting. Um, I had a manager who said, you should study for the CFE exam, the Certified Fraud Examiner um, exam. And even if you never use it, it's a great tool to have as an auditor. And so I studied for it, absolutely fell in love with it, didn't know how I was going to use it, but I had the certification under my belt. And I left that company, went to another company where um, it was a big public accounting firm. I did internal audit for multiple companies. If they didn't have an internal audit in their company, they outsourced it to us. And so I got a call one afternoon from my manager who said, hey, this client that you have, um, they've had some internal fraud. You have your CFE, right? Yeah, I do. I've never used it, but I have it. She's like, okay, well, this is your client. You know the client. I need you to fly down on Monday morning. I think this was like a Thursday, Friday. I need you to fly down Monday morning and help with this case. Okay, sounds great. So I talked to the client and they're like, oh, by the way, the OCC and the FBI are involved in this case. I'm like, Oh, great. (laughs) I've never done a case. I have the certification. I don't know what I'm doing, but I have my audit toolbox that I'm going to take with me and I know what to do for an audit investigation. So go down on Monday, uh, meet with the OCC, the FBI, both on the same case because of the complexity and what was going on with the case. They were both involved on the same um, investigation. And um, at that time, my, my specialty was not construction, but I absolutely loved construction and knew what was going on. But for this particular case, it was a bank in South Texas. And the head teller, what she was doing, they, they found out that she was doing this um, scheme, was she had, they had lines of credit for a construction company. Um, she had changed the address on the account. There was no repayment on the line of credit. It was just kind of an open credit. You make payments as you can, as you want to. And what she was doing was taking money off of the line of credit, but she had also changed the address for the statements to come to her directly. So the client was never getting statements. They didn't know what their line of credit was unless they were keeping their books. And so that's how they knew on their side what their balance should be. The other thing she did was she ordered checks off of this line of credit because you could write checks off of it. And she had the checks sent to her at the bank and said, oh, I'll deliver them to the client. I have a personal relationship with this client. So then she was also taking checks and writing personal checks to herself and then also taking draws off of the line of credit and depositing it into her parents' account. So she was paying her parents off of this line of credit as well. So the how she got caught was um, in banking. You have to they make the tellers take two weeks worth of vacation at one given time. Um, as you might know, in other industries, that's one of the things. The red flags is if somebody doesn't take vacation, something might be going on. So in banking, they make you take the two weeks. And so during that period when she was off, the construction owner of the company came in and said, hey, I recently got a statement. Not sure how the statement came to them because they normally weren't getting them. 
went into the bank and their records were different than what the bank had on the line of credit. So then while she was out, they started unraveling this scheme that she was doing. And so that's how it came about. The OCC got involved, the FBI, and the bank started to work this and unwind it. And they spent six months internally working this case themselves. And then finally, it just got to the point to where they were needing to file an insurance claim. And it just got to be really big that the OCC and FBI got in. And so that's when they called us in and said, your internal auditors, we need some help with this. And so I flew down and helped walk through putting the case together so that we could turn it over to the OCC and the FBI and so that they could um, turn it in to insurance and whatnot. So that's how I got my start as a fraud investigator. Yeah, that's awesome. So Um, Just in case our listeners don't know what the OCC is, can you tell us a little about that? Absolutely. So in the banking industry, they're regulated by the the OCC, which is the Office of the Comptroller of Currency. And so they're the regulators for the bank. Yeah. And how long had this teller been doing this? It had been years. I want to say like five or six years that she was doing this. Wow. And um, and so what was the total loss? I want to say by the end of it, it was a little over a million. Okay. Yeah. Wow. You know, what's interesting to me is that the customer didn't know that they should be getting a statement. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, you would think at the end of the year, I mean, when I was doing tax prep, we would ask for like an end of year statement for the loans to, Mm -hmm. to make sure that all tied out for a lot of our clients. So that's just really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And they were smaller construction company. And so they might not have had in-house accountants that knew to ask for that or knew yeah. know that it should, should have been ca- coming to them. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm really not sure how they eventually got a statement, but they just happened to come into the bank and say, this doesn't match what we have on our records. And then how did this, I mean, I, I'm going to ask things that you may or may not know, but like, how did the teller know to choose this client like or customer out of all the customers of the bank? You know, um, I'm not sure on this one. It might have been the terms of the line of credit. Um, because that there, she was able to get away with changing the address. I think she just had too much access on this one account. Yeah. Um, and there might've been instances that she was doing it on other accounts too. This might've just been the starting point of it, but this is the one that they could identify that she was doing it on. So okay. just like any other fraud case, it's usually not just one. They're doing it in multiple, multiple areas. So I'm sure there were others as well. Yeah. But you like, they didn't have you look into any other customer accounts. No, just- they were just really focused on this one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what About what time period did you go down and do this? Because I'm kind of thinking of it in relation to a case that I worked and, and just kind of the technology changes that were happening during that time. Yep. Um, what When was this roughly? What year you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. This was pro- in 2012, 2013. So they had already spent like six months on it. Their, they had done a system conversion to the bank. Yeah. had, So that was part of their limitation that they could only go back so far because they didn't have all the records. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure there was fraud going on prior in their old systems, but they just didn't have all the records. So that made it a challenge in this case as well. Yeah. So a couple of years, it would have been a couple of years prior to this. Um, but I think a lot of banks were going through system conversions around the same time, mm-hmm. which they I didn't know, like, I feel like at least at the ones that I worked around that same time frame, they didn't know what permissions were given, being given to what people and like what that really meant. Right. And so, yeah, I worked some bank stuff around then too. Just anytime there's a system conversion, it's like, oh, well, they probably found something in the system you didn't know existed and were exploiting, exploiting it. So, um, or yeah, in, in this one case, um, it was also a bank and it was a loan officer and she was kind of doing something similar, but I mean, she had hijacked a bunch of people's accounts. Uh, it was like over $3 million that she stole, but she had been stealing prior to the conversion. But whenever the conversion happened, it made everything way easier for her. Mm-hmm. And so like, if you graph to the loss by year, the loss in, in the years after the system conversion, but before they caught it, I mean, it's like exponential what it grew per year. So I just found that interesting. Well, cool. That's awesome. So did, was the case prosecuted by the FBI and did this individual? I'm not sure how it ended because I had left the firm. 
um, before it had, as you know, it takes a while for yes. these cases. Um, so I had already left the firm, so I'm not sure where it ended. Okay. Well, great. So with this case and it having a construction component, so you left this firm and was that when you started your practice? I had started a little bit later, um, a few years later, I was still an internal audit for a few years and then finally went out on my own because I didn't know that this could be a profession. I had a passion for it, but I just didn't have the, the right network um, after this case. And it was a, it took a few years to get into it. Um, so now that that's my focus. Yeah. So now you focus on construction fraud. I mean, you do a whole host of things, but in the area of fraud investigation. So I, I'd like to kind of talk about that. Uh, but first, we're going to take just a quick little break. At Workman Forensics, we're your modern day Sherlock Holmes. The team at Workman Forensics follows patterns to find money through forensic accounting and fraud investigation services. Using our data sleuth process, we build client cases telling the story of what actually happened. This process serves clients in the best way, whether they are going through a divorce, a partnership dispute, an estate and trust dispute, or a fraud investigation. So what is data sleuthing? Well, after serving clients in this best way for 10 years, we are proud of our technological improvements, making our investigations work similar to that of a manufacturing process. By following a consistent investigative and internal process, our team addresses client concerns in a timely, responsive, and thorough manner. But don't worry, clients don't go through this process alone. We believe communication is vital to the success of an engagement. So each client is guided by a highly trained and specialized expert forensic accountant along the way. And because we think data sleuthing is the best way to investigate financial disputes, we work to train other professionals as well through our investigation games, guided interactive workshops, and our Be A Data Sleuth seminars. To learn more about any of these services or trainings, visit our website, workmanforensics.com. In fact, our website is full of resources for anyone looking to learn more about forensic accounting, fraud investigation, or our data sleuth process. This includes blog posts, free Excel downloads, more podcast episodes, and links to our YouTube channel. So if you're looking to get into the investigation industry, or if you've been an investigator for years, we know you'll find something helpful in our free resources. So visit our website, workmanforensics.com. All right, welcome back to my conversation with Nicole. Nicole, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and correct myself from before the break that you, in the area of fraud investigation, you specialize in small business and construction. I'm going to add small business to that. Um, but we haven't had anyone on the podcast talking about construction. And so I'm curious, based on your experience, are there schemes that you see in construction companies and, and maybe even... Um, you know, I'm picturing like small businesses that are contractors or in the construction field. Are there schemes more often uh, than others that you investigate in your work? I'm not going to talk specifically about the scheme. Let's talk about how they usually come to surface because usually these are smaller construction companies and they only have one accountant in place. And so this one accountant has access to everything. So there could be a whole host of schemes that are going on. Uh, because they do have access to everything. So we've seen um, like the expense reports that they're, they're paying for themselves or they're um, reimbursing expenses that are personal. Um, we've seen the payroll scheme. So there's a whole host of schemes that we normally see, but it usually stems from the client only having one, usually one accountant in-house. And um, how do these usually come about? Do the do the clients say anything that's kind of similar whenever it's been detected or how they've discovered it? Usually they'll come when, because my firm also does like construction accounting. So they'll usually call first and they say, our bookkeeper, we don't get the reports. We don't know where we are. They're keeping everything to themselves and we're having to ask for reports all the time. So they think they need a new accountant, which more than happy to help with. But then having that fraud investigation background and working these cases, it kind of leads down to another path. And I start to ask those 
interview questions of, you know, those red flags that they might not know about and just ask them um, and not say like, hey, your bookkeeper is committing fraud, but start to ask those questions. And it kind of leads them down this path of there might be something else going on. And so then it might turn into a review of what's going on or start to ask some of those other questions to, to dig a little deeper to get into a fraud investigation first, and then we can help with the accounting as well. So it's kind of two tiered when it comes in. And I think that's what's special about my background and having the construction accounting and internal controls and fraud investigation all under one house and having that experience. Yeah. I think one of the most interesting things we get, you know, we're having to ask for these reports and things like that. One of the most surprising things, especially to new analysts is when a potential client will call and they'll say, you know, I own this business and either my business partner or my bookkeeper or some other employee won't give me the bank statements or I don't have access to the bank statements at the bank. Do you get that as well? All the time. I had a call like that this week where we had talked a couple months ago and they're talking about a system conversion. The two owners were on the call and the bookkeeper. So it's hard to ask those questions when the bookkeeper is involved in the initial conversation. Sure. And then I got a follow up email a couple weeks ago from the personal email of the owner because they also give their bookkeeper access to all the email accounts for every employee. Um, oh. So now in, in another email comes in from the owner from the personal email and says, we're still having issues. So then that's when I start to dig into maybe some of those fraud questions. And so now it's turned into a different in, engagement than it ri- originally was of just a system conversion. We're not getting the reports from our bookkeeper. So now I'm able to have those open conversations with the owner saying, I think we need to look a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So what are your goals when you're contacted about a fraud matter from one of these construction clients? Usually, so I I work the smaller businesses, the smaller construction companies, and a lot of times they don't have the money to prosecute, right? They don't have all the, the capital to go all of the way. But my end goal for them, and it might be different than what they see, but having that internal controls background is I really want them to address the issue. I want to stop the bleeding for one, get it cleaned up, but also prevent it from going again. Because most of the time these guys will come and they'll say, you know, we need this issue fixed, but I just want it to go away. I'm going to fire the bookkeeper and I need somebody new. But they don't understand that if they don't close these loopholes or these holes in their processes, it's going to happen again. Somebody else will find it or it might be happening somewhere else in the business. It might not be that person, but it might be helpful happening in other areas. So that's what I want to try and do is help them get it fixed so it doesn't happen or the chances are reduced going forward. Do you have a an example of a client um, that you can share that had a fraud issue and then they did successfully, you know, start implementing um, or improving their internal controls? Yeah. And one of the things that we do after this is um, like document the processes and we help set up processes going forward so that they can um, have those checks and balances. And then there's transparency. That's where they fall. A lot of the times I will say is that they don't have the transparency and they're not sure how to implement transparency. So we'll go in and implement an entire system that works for our accounting construction clients as well and give them more transparency. Um, And that's one of the things I talked about with this client this week is, hey, let's implement this system that I use for my other clients so that you can have the transparency and everybody's on the same page knowing what's going on. Um, So that's one of the the things that we do is try to document processes, but give them transparency too. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what, what, what might be a good example or case story about one of these types of cases? Um, I would say, uh, so a different client that I had, they had a project manager who was in the field um, that was approving time clocks, right? And also approving expense reports. And the owners, there's two two owners, husband and wife, um, they needed some more help in the office. So this project manager says, 
oh, my wife's available. Let's bring in my wife. So they bring in the wife to do some bookkeeping, but she's also um, processing payroll. Well, what they didn't think about was the project manager is approving time clocks. Then the wife is processing payroll. So essentially she is processing her husband's payroll. Mm -hmm. Um, So when I was on board, I identified this issue, came to the table with them and said, this just is not a good process to have the, this married couple, not that they're doing anything, but bring it to the surface and say, this is a possibility. So with that, then we started mapping out all of the processes where there might be conflicts and um, they might have overlaps in segregation of duties. So they removed the payroll processing from her plate and brought it onto our team to help process payroll and have an additional set of checks and balances. And then also with expense reports, we took it off of the wife processing it in-house and brought it to our team. So basically they were removing some of those accounting functions that they thought they needed help with in-house and brought it to our team just to have those checks and balances. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I can definitely, you know, because I think one of the things I've seen when maybe I've served on nonprofit boards and they get like this report of internal controls from, um, you know, the board will decide, let's have an accounting firm come in and do an internal control review. Mm -hmm. And then they get this report back and it's like, we don't even have enough people on staff to fulfill what they're recommending. And so I like that you're able to help them with that. um, So they don't have to hire like a whole nother person to help, you know, mitigate or reduce that risk. Um, And and then at the same time, this is what you and your team do. So you're good at it, you're efficient. And um, is just a win all around. Absolutely. And I think they don't think about these things either. They're like, we need resources. We trust the husband that's in the field. He's doing a great job. Let's bring in the wife. She's going to be a good worker as well. Um, So they have that trust factor with the family and they're big. That company was big on family. So they Mm -hmm. just don't think about those workflows. And so that's what I like to do with my clients is let's map this out a little bit so you can see it. And it changes their mind shift too going forward. So it helps strengthen their business. They're not just a small business owner anymore. They have Mm -hmm. to think about the risk management going forward. Yeah, exactly. You know, that kind of brings up another thing because I've seen this with our clients as well. Um, And I guess maybe having just the work experience I have, it just always seems odd to have family members overseeing other family members and things like that. But it is really common. Yes. And 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 I don't think, I mean, I think, I think I grew up with my family saying, don't go into business together, you know? So maybe that's the difference, but I'm just always amazed at how common it is. Yes. And I see it too with like, um, mom and wives will be doing the books, not saying that they're, um, stealing from you, but you never know like what, what they could do. I have seen a husband wife combo to where the husband had a mistress on the side. And so he was stealing from the wife's company. So I have seen it, not saying it never happens. It does happen. And you just, you have trust in your family members and you know, they can help you and maybe they need a job or it's another responsibility of, Oh, I just need five, 10 hours a week. So I, it is very, very common. Yeah. It's just interesting because I think in larger organizations that is frowned upon, you know, there's policies and procedures in place for that, but yeah, in small business, that is, that is really common to let, you know, I, I have this one case I talk about in one of my trainings where the daughter was working for this business and then they're like, oh, you're not really the greatest manager. The owner says this. And so they're like, and she says, oh, my mom has manager, managerial experience. And they're like, yeah, let's do that. Well, anyway, yeah. mom and daughter just teamed up and stole all their money. Yes. But um, it's just really high risk, high risk of collusion for sure. Yes, absolutely. And it's hard to have those conversations too. I don't know how you've had those oh. conversations of your daughter stealing from you or your mother stealing from you. Right. Nobody wants to think about that. I mean, even just from, you know, like estates and trusts and things like that. Mm -hmm. And way down the line when people discover, oh man, I never thought my sister would do that. My brother would do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So what are a few things that just kind of come to the surface or first in your mind that your clients, just an easy fix for preventing fraud that you commonly see? One of the things you touched on briefly earlier is not having access to where your clients come to you and say, I don't have access to anything. I think even if you're a business owner, you're still responsible for the health of your business And it's your responsibility to still have access and understand the systems. You don't have to know all the ins and outs, but navigate your way around um, and definitely have access to everything. You should have access to the bank account. You should have access to 
um, the accounting system. And I get that call all the time of like, okay, we think our bookkeeper's stealing from us, but we don't have access to anything. So now how are we going to get that information from the bookkeeper and how do we keep them from destroying records? So that is an area we have to navigate quite a bit too and have those critical conversations of what are we really doing here so we don't trigger anything. Um, so I would say one, have access to everything. You're you still need to have oversight as the business owner. Um, two, we talk about this a lot and I'm sure you've posted about it and I've posted about it on LinkedIn about having bank statements sent to your house, still review them or even have access online and take a look at checks that are being written out. Is it for construction? Are we paying a painter, but we're in the framing? Like we're not in the right stage of the project. Why are we paying a contractor that we're, we shouldn't be doing work with right now? So just open checks online or open the bank statements, have them sit to your house and do a, a sanity check of saying, okay, what's going out? Mm-hmm. Um, you talk about this a lot on the payroll side. You know, um, We do this for our construction clients is they might not know all of the details. They don't need to know all of the details, ins and outs, but have a spot check every week. If you're paying payroll every single week, um, what, what are your, your totals? What should they be? What's common? And if there's fraud already going on, you might not catch it that because that's what it's been forever, but do some high level checks on your payroll, um, just to see what's going out the door. Cause that's one area that gets manipulated quite a bit in small businesses. Yeah, for sure. That's um, I know that w- even within my business, you know, we bill by the hour. So my employees are paid by the hour, that type of thing. And so if there's ever a risk, you know, I mean, cause I'm constantly identifying risks in my business, even though we're all supposed to be forensic accountant and fraud investigators, but what is the risk? And it's definitely in payroll and I've spotted it. It's been a really long time, but somebody wasn't at the office and they were still charging time. And so that that's definitely, I mean, it's the easiest thing for someone to um, overstate the employee, overstate their time and, uh, and then payroll reports. Oh my gosh. There's, I mean, they look pretty, but <laughs> there's not like a quick way, you know, you can get the Excel and, and we have our download um, payroll analysis download, but like it doesn't come in an easily, in an easy format to analyze quickly. Right. Because of just how that works. So yeah, there's definitely high risk. I could see that, especially in construction. And then I'm guessing too, in construction projects, you also might have a bunch of people working during a certain time, but then not in others. So another area that we see too in construction is fuel card abuse. That is a high level area. And that's an easy one. Um, that people can cheat the system. Oh, I'm traveling. And, you know, we're starting to look at it like, are they fueling up on the weekends? And where are they fueling? Um, I look at the receipts, they have to turn in all of the receipts. And I've seen it where they're in, they're fueling up in a different state. So get back to the CEO, like, what, what is going on? Why are they filling up in a different state? So we some analytics on fuel charges. And we've had clients that have fired people because of fuel abuse. That's one that gets abused quite a bit in construction. Yeah, I can totally see that. Well, before we wrap up, is there an investigation or or like a case you'll never forget that you'd like to share with us? There is one. So the same um, banking client that we talked about earlier, they were notorious for fraud. They had fraud going on for years before we, and they were under the watch of the OCC. They put them on a watch list because of all the the things that were going on. But a second case popped up while I was there as well. Um, Like system conversions, as you mentioned, one of the officers of the company had too much access. Her husband had a local business. They had um, a CD and they were getting interest on their CD, on their money on the CD. This officer went in and she increased the rate that they were collecting on the CD. It should have been like 4%. They were getting paid like 7%. The thing that was crazy about this one was um, they were small and it had been going on for several years. It wasn't until we had done an audit in this area that we found it, but they had fired her and she had shown up while we were on site 
doing another internal audit. And I've never really had conflicts with people, but it kind of put us on edge of like, we know she was committing fraud. She's already been fired. She's under watch. They're prosecuting her and she shows up on location. Um, So I've never had that happen before, but that's one that I will not forget that it got very uncomfortable very quickly. Yeah, that would be really awkward, like intimidation or something. But I mean, you never know what people are going to do if they're just going to go on and and not make a ruckus or do anything bad. Um, But it still puts you on high alert when you're on site and they they show up. Yeah, for sure. Well, Nicole, thank you so much for taking time to talk with me today. Uh, If any of our listeners would like to connect with you or learn more about your work, what's the best way to do so? I post a lot of content on LinkedIn. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Nicole Landau, last name is spelled L-A-N-D-A-U. Follow me there, connect me there, um, send me a message um, or email me. My email is Nicole at Landau Consulting Solutions. It's a little bit long, so best way is probably LinkedIn. Sounds good. And we'll make sure to link to this in the show notes. But thank you again. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.